Okay, let's get started. Welcome, everybody. Good afternoon. How are you? You know, I have never missed a commencement. I was at Purdue University until about a year and a half ago, came down here to teach. I've never missed a commencement because it's the only place I know of where you can go and every single person in the room is happy. <laughs> there is, is there any other place like that? Can you think of a place? I can't think of a place. So, well, congratulations to the young people uh, in the room, the students, uh, candidates for graduation. Congratulations to the parents and grandparents and, and family members, too. Um, it's a great weekend, and I'm very privileged to be with you to talk to you about this very provocative sounding <laughs> title. I hope it'll make sense to you afterwards. I don't have many planes, trains, or automobiles in the talk, so it may be a little uh, deceptive of a title. So let's get started. So I'm a professor, so I always start off with a quiz. I hope that's okay. <laughs> and just if there are any students thinking you're going to graduate tomorrow, you have to pass this. I, we should have told you that. So I hope you're cool with that. Is that okay? Okay, so what, what was the most significant technological achievement in the last half century? I don't, I don't need raise of hands. I just want people to yell things out. Just give me some ideas. Cell phones, Cell phones what else? Computers. Computers, what else? Internet, what else? GPS. GPS, what else? What do you think? Jet engines? Wow, I love these ideas because actually what I'm going to show you was the impetus for every single thing you just said. How many people in the room remember where you were and what you were doing when this mission was conducted? And when Neil Armstrong walked on the moon? How many people? Raise a hand. You know, anyone that was ever alive when that happened, I, I get that kind of same response. Usually about 80, 85 percent of the people in the room remember where they were. As an engineer, I want to be a part of something like that. I want to be able to say I was a part of something that 85% of my fellow citizens remember, and that's what this mission was like. Um, my dad talks about it. He's not an engineer. He owned a grocery store in a small town, but he understood this and what it meant for the nation. And so almost every single thing you just mentioned came from this mission, okay? From jet engines and propulsion, tang. to cell phones, to <laughs> GPS and Tang, and yes, freeze-dried food, which I know all of you rely on. Um, but what a great moment and what a great scientific and engineering feat. Um, so I am standing here, in fact, now this doesn't rank with cell phones, but I am standing here because of Neil Armstrong. This museum is 20 miles from where I grew up in Wapakoneta, Ohio, the Neil Armstrong Air and Space Museum in Wapakoneta, Ohio. I went to this every time the Cub Scouts went somewhere, they went here. Every time elementary, middle school, high school went somewhere, they went here. Every trip was to the Neil Armstrong Air and Space Museum. And it literally inspired me, and so I went to University of Cincinnati, where guess, guess who was teaching? Neil Armstrong. I went to Purdue University for my first job, right? Guess where Neil Armstrong went to school? And there's a statue of him, right, outside the Armstrong building at Purdue University studying as a young man with a slide rule. How many people use slide rules as engineers? This young man right here did. So I became an engineer because of that mission and because of, because of what NASA accomplished. So there's a lot of technology that we trust that came from, from that endeavor, including cell phones and GPS and long distance communication, including rehabilitative uh, uh, medicine and, and artificial limbs and, and rehabilitative uh, therapeutics. Every single person in this room got here on a car driven on radial tires that came from the NASA Endeavor uh, for the, from the Apollo program. Goodyear invented radial tires to support the NASA Apollo missions. Okay, so that's the tire you use, and you didn't even maybe know it. So a lot of cool things uh, came from this. So my question is this. What's the next... What's the next leap? What's the next technology? What's the next thing that, when it happens, everyone will say, I remember where I was when that happened, right? What do you think? Nobody knows, yeah. Nobody does know. We'll know when we see it, right? Um, so I want to just play a little experiment here. Um, I need you to play along with me, um, and I need you to close your eyes, okay? And when you close your eyes, I need you to imagine automotive manufacturing. So what, what I want you to do is form a mental picture. 
When I say automotive manufacturing, what do you imagine? You've seen, you know, nightly newscasts. You may even have worked in an automotive plant. Uh, you may have toured an automotive plant. Think of that. And then after you've thought of that, open your eyes. And is this what you saw? Did you see something that looked a little bit like this, kind of an assembly line? Something, we're cutting metal, we're stamping metal. It's kind of loud and noisy, maybe a little dirty. Not very sustainable because we're not using a lot of things that are re recyclable uh, in that industry. So is that what it's always going to look like? Right? That's how we make things today. Um, right now, this is how we make the modern jetliners, the modern airplanes that we're all flying to and from on. This is a new composite aircraft manufacturing process. This is in Wichita, actually. One of our alumni from the School of Engineering is chief technical officer at this plant in Spirit Aerospace in Wichita, Kansas. This is, they're baking the fuselage. They have just woven, they've just knitted together the new fuselage for the Boeing 787 aircraft. Airbus makes their new aircraft like this. 30% more fuel efficient than the metal counterparts. And it's additive. You see how they're building it from one layer to the next. From one they're not building it and then cutting it and stamping it and welding things. They're building it from, from the ground up, if you will. And so that's the modern jetliner. Now, that's very expensive, okay? But there are a lot of kind of exciting things happening right now. And one of them is this technology. How many people saw this? This was in Chicago. And what this represents, there we go. What this represents is a, what's called an additive manufacturing process. You can see it being built from the ground up. Mo modern day automobiles have about, oh, 5,000, right? Five to 10,000 components. This has about 10 components in it, okay? Because they manufacture as what's called a monocoque structure. They manu manufacture everything more or less together in one piece out of carbon fiber material. And by the way, it's very safe because race cars are done this way, right? They make race cars out of carbon fiber, reinforced polymer. In other words, plastic that has carbon fiber in it to make it strong. And so imagine going to an automotive manufacturing dealer, right, where there's a factory sitting at the dealership the size of a tractor trailer. And you go in the morning, you say, I like this, 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 and this, and you come back four hours later and your car has been printed. Okay? Took them four days to print this car. Right? Its top speed is, they're targeting is 40 miles per hour. So we're not competing yet with the Maseratis of the world, but we are on the verge, literally, of changing everything that we make. And the way in which we make things is fundamentally on the verge of changing. And I think that's going to change. That's going to be the next real technology breakthrough, is that the way we make things and the materials we use to make things with is fundamentally changing from this point forward. And that's going to have ramifications that you can't even imagine right now. Right? Factories maybe aren't going to span hundreds of acres. They're going to be the size of a car. Okay? And you're going to be able to computer program it and, and do all the kinds of things you do. So we're at a really real turning point. And so the question that I ask myself as a, as a teacher and as a researcher is this question. So if we're going to change everything we're building, how do we build things you, you will trust, right? How do we build things you'll trust? Because as an engineer, this is the sacred responsibility, okay? You have to build things that are safe and affordable and people want to buy and, and that people can trust. And so uh, this is one of my graduate students, actually, at the top of this wind turbine in Texas. This is the obligatory joke where I tell you that this is where I put all my students that don't listen to me. <laughs> and all the students in the room are saying, wow, I'm glad I didn't have that guy in class. So this is, this is, uh, this is a technology we're working on, and I'll talk about it a little later, uh, wind turbines. Now, the reason we're interested in building wind turbines, bless you, that we trust, is because I have one question for you, and I'm going to guess the answer. Do you want to be this guy? How many people, can I, see a, can I see a show of hands, <laughs> right? How many people want to rappel down a blade and look for cracks and look for damage? This is how we maintain turbines right now, these large utility scale wind turbines that are out on the countryside in the Midwest primarily and also offshore increasingly, right? We have to inspect them like this. It's a dangerous job um, and there's a better way to do it, we think. Um, and so I know you don't want to be him and so we have to develop 
wind turbines you can trust uh, using different techniques. Okay, and so just to prove how challenging this is, right, and because I'm going to show you a demo in a minute with this little piece of wind turbine blade, and right now it doesn't look like much, but I want to show you, this came out of a much larger blade, and I want to show you just how big. How many people live around wind turbines? Anybody live anywhere near, where do you live, sir? Uh, Western Massachusetts. Western Massachusetts, so you see a few. Who else raised their hand? Here, where do you live? Outside Chicago, okay, so see, I was at Purdue for a number of years, and so I'm sure the, the drive from Chicago to Indianapolis, you saw the, uh, somebody once said that it sort of resembled to them War of the Worlds at night, because the lights would blink all synchronously, and so it's a, it's a really interesting uh, sight on the countryside of Indiana. So just to kind of give you a, a, a sense of scale, that's the Boeing 787 brand new jetliner that's built using that technique I showed you a minute ago knitting together using carbon fiber. That's one of the largest land-based wind turbines. Now keep your eyes on that aircraft. Don't blink or you'll miss this. <laughs> that is a length scale, length scale comparison. I can't show you the diameter, right? And the, 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 other, the other dimensions are harder to show you in two dimensions in the picture. But that just gives you a sense of how huge this is, okay? And so we work, and just in case you're not convinced, I wanna, I wanna show you another picture. This is the first automated wind turbine, uh, actually invented by Charles Brush from Cleveland, Ohio, not too far from where I grew up, uh, back in the 1800s, actually. So the first automated wind turbine, you can see Charles down there uh, in the lower right-hand corner standing. So that's how big Charles Brush's wind turbine is compared to a modern-day utility-scale offshore wind turbine rotor. You can see it's about the size of a tugboat. And, and for you students out there, and I know you, you'll, you'll especially appreciate that, you could not fit this, you could not fit this rotor with the blades on it on the football field there where the Commodores play, okay? That's how big it is. So this isn't trivial, okay? And so what we're going to be showing you as a demonstration, you, you can imagine why it's important. So the question is, uh, what are the types of things we're concerned about as engineers in building wind turbines you can trust. Well, we're not concerned about the things we understand, right? Engineers are good. They define all the things they understand and then they design around that, right? We're great at that. We're not so good at dealing with things we don't know. So Houston, we have a problem. This, this animation shows a real problem we have in wind turbines, and that is that they don't operate alone. They actually operate in little families, okay? And so what you see here is that they're operating as a wind farm and that they're interacting with each other. You can see that, right? They're, one wind turbine is rotating, taking energy out of the wind, and then that wind goes downstream and strikes the next turbine. And then it has to try to do its job, right? And then it sends the wind downstream, and so on, and so on, and so on. These are called wake interactions. They can lead to 20 to 30% reduction in electricity that's produced by a wind farm. Worse yet, they can, they can lead to wind turbines that have a bad day, that have maintenance related issues. They, they have early failures associated with their operation. So we're, we're concerned about things like this. So the question is, how do, we, how, do we, how do we study this? Well, we have to build experiments. And so out at our laboratory across town, my colleagues and I have, have been studying these so-called wake interactions, where you can actually see the downstream stream turbine there. It's turning. It's turning because it's communicating with that turbine upstream. And so we study those interactions, those conversations. And we do that using the kind of technology that you'll see here in a minute because we don't understand fully these interactions. And so we have to develop technology that can help us study. So the question is again, how do we build things we can trust? Well, one way to do that is to build smart wind turbines by embedding sensors and algorithms, intelligence, and adding intelligence to the blades in this case that allow us to do the kinds of things you see here in this little video where as the blade is responding to that turbine that's upstream, right, we're measuring its response constantly. We're tracking its response. And by tracking its response, we can see if it's pointed the wrong direction, we can see if it's pitched in the wrong way, and we can see if it's communicating with turbines that are elsewhere on the wind farm. And again, we're doing that so that we can make more productive wind farms that, that fail less often, if that makes sense. So, Kind of the answer, to the, the answer to the first question is that one approach we're, we're, we're considering to build systems you can trust is to build smart systems, to put sensors, algorithms, computer algorithms 
into these systems so that they respond. Somebody in the hallway said something interesting on the way in here, and that is, this gentleman here said, I hope we don't ever drive on a highway system where every car is automated. And, and I said, well, I, there are a lot of challenges. But I said, I, one thing I'd really like to see is what I saw last night on a news report, which is tractor trailers that had a, have automatic assist system when drivers fall asleep. I would really like to see those systems because a lot of people die every year um, in accidents like that. So there could be a lot of advantages to having this kind of intelligence. And in wind turbines, uh, my colleague Noah and I have been working on, again, making systems smarter. And I want to make sure that you understand that when I talk about smart systems, I'm not talking about putting my Apple IIe computer inside of this wind turbine, right? That's what I grew up with. That's what I learned to program on. Okay, it's embarrassing to admit that, but that's, I was excited by that, those two big drives you saw there. But I'm talking about embedded computer systems, com computer systems that are like an inch by an inch, and they're thousands of times more powerful than my Apple IIe computer was, right? So a lot of technology out there to help us build smart systems. And so we can do a lot of interesting things with smart systems. So imagine that we have a wind turbine blade like this right here, and imagine that it's damaged. And we'd like to know if it's damaged. So one thing we do is we study ways to embed those, those sensing systems, that intelligence, into the blade. So for instance, we might have a probing signal, and it might send acoustic energy out into the blade, and it, it would be able to then sense that the crack is present as the blade is, is kind of moving. And you might think this idea is crazy, but it turns out nature thought of this idea a long time ago. This is an orb web spider outside my window, outside my living, living room window, and it's, it's ensnared prey here. And it's done it using exactly the technique I just showed you. So orb web spiders build, they're called orb web spiders because they build an orb web. And they sit at the center of the web, and then they constantly take their, their feet, right, and they pluck the web, just like a guitar string. And the acoustic energy travels out from the center, and when there's prey, that acoustic energy helps the spider locate where the prey is, and then they can track it down and, and do what's needed to survive, okay, which is, which, is a, which is another talk at Vanderbilt that you'd have to go see. But, but this is really kind of a nature-inspired way to build systems. So now what I have is a demonstration, okay? Um, so I, I guess I'm looking, for, I'm looking for a young person. I was hoping we'd have like a, a, young, a young brother and sister somewhere, but maybe it doesn't matter. Do I have any volunteers at all? Okay, come on down, sir. So let's get our, let's get our, let's get our screen on. Let's get our, let's get our screen on here. Is it working? Okay. Okay. So we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna have you, do, what's your name? I'm Charlie. Charlie, good to meet you. I'm Doug. Nice to meet you. And what's your story? Do you have a relative or are you graduating I'm tomorrow? I'm graduating. Okay, and from what? <laughs> yeah, let's give him a, okay. From? From? Uh, from here? Yeah. Peabody. From Peabody. Yeah, okay, very good. Where are you headed after this? Doing Venture for America. Really neat. Well, congratulations. Peabody. Awesome program. Work with people from Peabody. Okay, I'm going to let you play in a minute, okay? But, so this is a piece of wind turbine blade. So imagine that it, you're a large wind turbine offshore. Imagine there's a hail storm. Imagine that that hail could damage the skin of the, you can see it's kind of built like with two skins. Imagine it could damage. So imagine you have some hail, and it's not responding. <laughs> Let's try again. It's monitoring. It's, it's thinking about it here. This is the danger of a, this is a danger of an auto, of, an, of a, uh, of a real-time demonstration. Let's try it again. And it's still thinking. And it's still thinking. So what's your name again? Charlie. Charlie, go sit down. <laughs> Charlie is going to come back again. Noah is going to work over the next 20 minutes to try to get our data acquisition system figured out. And actually, as much of an irony as this is, right, smart systems, not that we can't trust during a presentation, <laughs> it proves a very important point, okay? And this is the point I actually wanted to make. It's complicated. It is. It's complicated. I mean, I've got to have a sensor with a cable. It's got to plug into the system. It's got to be charged through this USB port, right? And then the computer has to be operating well. It's, what is it, MS-DOS? It's a Windows system. It's a Windows 7 system. Who knows whether it's going to work, right? It's a Windows 7 system. So here's the thing. 
There, there are a lot of technologies like this, but they require sensors. My colleagues work on technologies for, for, surg for surgery. Uh, Pietro works on some really cool surgical robotic technology and mechanical engineering. Um, my colleague Janos works on some really interesting weapon systems uh, with Department of Defense. Again, require a lot of sensors, a lot of intelligent algorithms. So we just saw that the demonstration failed, right? Because in part, it's kind of complicated. The question is, could we make it simpler? Could we build materials that are intelligent in the first place, right? We've got these new ways to build things. Let's build materials that are intelligent from the beginning. So we don't need to have these kinds of complicated sort of devices. So my, qu my next question is, what do paper clips and bridges have in common? How many people have done the paper clip experiment? Did you do that? Yeah, I mean, we worry, we, we worry about whether we can trust them. Have you taken a paper clip and like bent it back and forth? What happens if you bend a paper clip back and forth enough? Eventually it breaks. Why does it break? Fatigue, yeah, because, but it breaks, but you can't really tell it's going to break. It's kind of surprising when it breaks. It just all of a sudden breaks, okay? So this is kind of what bridges have in common. Some, all of a sudden, sometimes they'll just fail, and nobody knew that they were accumulating damage, and they were reaching a point where they might exhibit a failure. So we're working on technologies. That's really the Achilles heel of the engineer, right? Here's a... Here's a video that doesn't appear that it's uh, playing either. <laughs> Boy, you know, this was the right talk for me. Technology we can trust. There we go. Let's try again. Let's, let's try again here. Let's play it here. Okay, so that's just a piece of epoxy. It's just a material that engineers use. So it, it didn't look like it was going to fail necessarily. It looked like it was behaving just fine, and then all of a sudden it fails. This is, epoxy does this. It's a very brittle material, and all of a sudden it can fail kind of unexpectedly. By the way, they pay me to do this. <laughs> I love breaking things. It's, it's one of my favorite things in the world to do. And so, okay, so you've gotten the point. So we're really interested in this question. Can we build, instead of sensors and algorithms and complicated things, can we build a mood ring for materials? Can we build a material that will tell us when it's in jeopardy of failure? Because if we could, we could save all those bridge engineers a lot of time having to crawl underneath bridges to go up and look at bridges. We could even have the bridge changing color, right, to sort of change us, kind of like a diaper. I would use a technology that sounds more advanced than that, but yes, ma'am, that's a very good <laughs> example. So that's exactly what we're doing. You can see this little cartoon up in the upper right-hand corner. We're taking materials, we're decorating them with what are called nanocrystals. And then as damage sets in, those nanocrystals change their emission spectrum. In other words, they change their color. And as the damage accumulates, more and more color change occurs, and we're seeing a change in the color uh, in that diagram there in the bottom right-hand corner. And so, you know, we started with some kind of interesting ideas here. Materials that bruise, right, was another idea we're, we're, we're exploring. You know, we bruise, right? You can see when we've been damaged. So we're looking at skins that actually help us understand when materials have been damaged. Does it work now? Yes. Okay, we'll do it in a minute. <laughs> I'll believe it when I see it. <laughs> so this is my colleague, Kane Jennings, uh, chemical engineering, and I and, and our student, Cole, are working on this technology. So the, the, the kind of the second approach, right? One is smart systems, which we hope is going to be reliable here in a moment. But the other is smart materials. The other is intelligence built intrinsically in materials. That material on the left is a smart material. It has a lot of nanocrystals in it that exhibit a change in their emission spectrum whenever the material starts to exhibit a lot of internal damage in its, in its state. And so we had to ask ourselves the question, this is a great idea, but how do we manipulate matter? And the answer is we have to get to the bottom. And when I say get to the bottom, I mean really, really small, right? We have to go way down at the nanometer scale. But what we're going to do is we're going to tweak the material and we're going to allow it to exhibit a color change, right, by just simply using what we all know, which is, you know, the sort of red, blue, green kind of color scale to achieve this color change. And so, you know, we have to go down to the nanometer scale. Now, how small is a nanometer? Does anybody have a sense of that, how small that is? It's smaller than this. Okay, there's a little dot. You see that little dot? I'm going to press the button there, and then it's going to shrink. And then I'm going to show you that compared to human hair, a nanometer is really small. 
Okay? And by the way, that's true even for a middle-aged man like me whose hair is thinning very rapidly as we speak. So you, human hair is around you know, 50 to 100 micron in, in diameter, and we're talking a nanometer, which is a lot smaller, about 50,000 times thinner than that. So very, very small. We're fundamentally, fundamentally manipulating the matter at the smallest scale. Okay, and so Talith is going to tell you about this. Okay, so what she said, because Talitha is a chemist and she's a genius, is that she's going to grow these nanocrystals. She's going to literally, just like we saw the car being built, using what's called additive manufacture, in other words, de depo sort of depositing the material from the ground up, that's how she's building the nanocrystals. She's depositing them, but at a much smaller length scale. And so that's what she did. She built uh, a material with these nanocrystals. And then we exposed the material to the kinds of damaging forces that it would that it would uh, experience, for instance, in that video that I showed you. Okay, and what's interesting is that it experiences a color change. Now, we can't look at it with the naked eye and see this color change, which, by the way, is probably a pretty good idea. Because I don't know about you, but I don't want to go on an airplane that's a different color than the airplane next to it. That just would make me nervous. So I kind of like the idea that we have to look at it through certain wavelengths, right, where maybe we aren't as sensitive to with our, with our vision but yet we could still be able to discern the difference in the emission uh, a spectrum. And so that's exactly what happens. We see a change in the emission as a function of the damaged state of this material. So coal, if we have the video uh, working, will tell you why this is important in what we do. And I, I don't know why these videos are not. There we go. OK, let's try that again. Okay, so imagine that you're in California, right? Or imagine you're in another area of the world, areas of the world that experience heavy quake activity and, and aftershocks. And you walk up to a bridge that just experienced an earthquake. Is it safe? You don't know. Is the building safe, right, before you go in to try to retrieve the people that are inside the building? But what if you had materials that were intrinsically sensing safety all the time? and telling you whether you can trust those materials, whether it's a bridge column or whether it's a beam, right, or whether it's the deck of this bridge structure. So you can imagine that in particular in civil infrastructure, there's a real need for materials that think for themselves because we just can't afford to deploy all these sensors and, and algorithms that sometimes behave kind of in a finicky manner when you're trying to do a demonstration for nice people. So we're doing a lot of interesting work uh, at our new facility across town. That's what these little videos are about here. Uh, I'm just showing you here kind of what our, what our research is about and the kind of work we do. Next time you come back, you have to come visit. Uh, it's kind of a fun, fun place to visit. It's kind of like the Phantom Works of Vanderbilt University, uh, except we train students, and that's our fundamental, fundamental objective. Um, if my if my clicker would work, we could go on to the next level here. So our mission is to create technology we can trust. That's really our focus, and we do that using a variety of technology, includes, including these nanocrystals, smart materials that you, that you saw a minute ago, and we train students while we do that. And students, because that's what this weekend's about, are incredibly creative. And here are some students who were working at the lab last year building some wind turbines um, and testing them. And, and really, that's what our lab does, is to, to build these systems we can trust, 
we take students and sort of the creativity and the work that they do as undergraduate and graduate student researchers and we apply that in these important problems like ensuring that civil infrastructure and, and, and airplanes and automobiles, right, are safe uh, for you, the, the citizens. So that's what I have. Um, that's, that's all I have. But we're going to bring you back down. And could you make sure this is working? <laughs> it's working. This okay, time. good. All right, so let's try this again. So remember that thing I said about smart systems not working? So no, they work just fine. So let's see, are we, is it, is it going to be on here in a second? Please wait. Okay. It works. Okay, so what I can do is I can just hit this. You can come down here and, and try your arm at this and hit this really as, hit this as hard as you want. So, oh, not so hard, channel two. <laughs> so it, it hit a little too hard. Not so hard again. Here, give this, a, give this a shot. It might be a parlor track. Did I overload it? Yeah. Remember that thing I said... <laughs> So, you know, what happens is, right, the devil's in the details. See, if you hit it too hard, the sensor we chose isn't strong enough to measure that large hit. And so the algorithm doesn't work as effectively. That's why we need smart material. See, look, he hit it light, so it worked. Okay, there we go. It's effective. Are there any questions? That's all I have today. Did it make sense? Was it interesting? Was it worth coming to? Yeah. Where are you going next? Yeah, no, we're not serving beer. <laughs> the strawberries and champagne is tomorrow. Any questions? You've got to have some questions. What about from the engineer in the room? Sorry, go ahead. The nanocrystals are printable. So if you think about that, that 3D printing exercise I showed you earlier, the way it would work is you would put the nanocrystals in that mixture, right, that resin material, the, the material that's deposited, and so it would be intrinsically in the, 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 the material that you use to build up that, 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 you know, that component. And so, in fact, you could... The other idea is that, of course, in the fiber uh, spinning operation that you saw for the airplane, you could just decorate the fiber with the nanocrystals as well. Well, actually, you can go buy a printer right now for $150, but not one that you can print a car with. Yeah, so, so I think, you know, the, the, the technologies for 3D printing, you know, you, it can go anywhere from $100 to, to, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars for very large systems. But actually, right up the road from us at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, it turns out we have the world authorities in 3D printing. And so they've made what's called the BAM the big area additive manufacturing apparatus. They can print a house with this structure. And it's actually really inexpensive. They partnered with a large machine manufacturer. So all these people that used to build machines in the United States, right? So those people haven't been building a lot of machines in the last decade because we haven't been building enough manufacturing facilities. But now they're really revving up to build these kind of next generation manufacturing facilities like this additive manufacturing facility. You had a question. Yeah. Uh, when you talked about space programs, it reminded me of the conversation uh, a group of people I worked with had. Uh, and I'd like to get your thoughts on some of the discussion. So uh, I'm from Florida, working in Florida. We happen to be uh, one of the launches from uh, Facility Cafe. We got talking about space programs quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that came out of the conversation I think when you, when you set a target like we're going to go to the moon and we're going to come back, that's important, that second one. When we're going to send a man to the moon and we're going to come back. So the, the things that have to be done, right, in terms of science and engineering, things that you wouldn't even recognize, right, if you saw them. 
in the world. Lighting, okay? Water filters came from that program, right? Why? Because we had to filter water, okay, for the astronauts. So, but I think actually the thing that was most important about the space program, which isn't talked about enough, is that it inspired a generation to become scientists and engineers. I became an engineer because of the space program. I am not alone. There were a lot of people I went to school with that became scientists and engineers and mathematicians because of the space program. So to me, the most important thing that we lost when we lost a, a space agency and the mission that that agency you know, sought to achieve is that inspiration uh, for people in STEM, in science, technology, engineering, mathematics. So all the things that you see from, from dry, freeze-dried food to, to, uh, to, what did you say? Diapers. Diapers to Velcro, right? I mean, people use those as examples, and they're important, and all those things you said are correct. But to me, the thing that, is, that you can't put a price tag on is that we had an entire generation of people that were inspired to go and do the next thing. And, and so that's what excites me about sort of creating new materials and, and thinking out of the box about how we make everything is that it has the potential, I think. I've seen young people building things with 3D printers, you know, and, and they can just do anything, right, um, uh, with, with their imagination. So I think, I think we, really need to, we really need programs like that, like the space program, to, to energize people. So that would be my view on what, you know, what the impact was. I think it was both in terms of technology but also in terms of human talent. Yes, sir. Sort of a theoretical question I'm playing around with. When you get down to these tiny, tiny levels, you call them nano, I don't know what the word, what, how little that is. Yeah. And you add a sensor. Does adding the sensor change the nature of the material? <laughs> yeah, it's a really good question. Um, it, it does change the nature of material. And, and so the, the trick, right, is to, to do that in a way that doesn't change the properties we like, <laughs> strength, durability, Right, these these properties that we care about, um, but but change the properties that we don't like. Okay, so you know you you when you cure cancer, you don't want to hurt the good cells, you want to hurt the bad cells, and so similarly in materials engineering and, and kind of innovation, we wanna we wanna tailor the changes we make um, in a, in a very controllable way, and and so that there is a. There's always a risk. And so just as an example, so do you know how long it took? You know that the winding I showed you of the Boeing aircraft? Do you know how long it took for carbon fiber to go from a laboratory where somebody invented it to being, being on the airplane that you flew on here? 60 years. Do you know why it took 60 years? Because they had to test that material under all the myriad conditions that they could imagine and that they couldn't imagine that the material would undergo. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to get between now and applying these materials in a much shorter period of time by, again, building trust into the material. Because if we don't do that, a lot of really cool ideas are going are to never be adopted because we're never going to trust them. We can't spend $100 million, $200 million on every new material. So we need, we need to build materials we can trust in the first place. And so it's a really good question and, and a lot of risk uh, associated with, with this work. But that's why, we're doing, that's why we're doing research on it. That's why we need smart students to do things. Yes, sir. What's the biggest obstacle um, in, in where you are now as we have an airplane that can detect pressure from people on the Is it money? Is it just the detectability? Is it other, other people opposed to it? Like what's, what, at the moment, what's the issue that you're looking for? Yeah, actually, the biggest practical barrier is nobody wants to add anything to their material once they've built it and, and once, it, once it's functioning in the way that they want it to function. So. That's kind of another reason why this, this approach with adding sensors and adding algorithms, it's an approach that, as attractive as it is from a standpoint of doing it sort of in the aftermarket, as attractive as that is, once you've certified an aircraft or a bridge or anything else for that matter, adding something to it puts that certification in jeopardy, right? It's like you lose your warranty. So that's the reason why we really are you know, working on developing these materials that have these intrinsic capabilities because then the material, right, can be built right at the beginning and we don't have to add anything afterwards. And so in an airplane, you don't want to add weight, right? You don't want to add complexity. Uh, you want it to be simple. You want it to be reliable. So I think the biggest barrier actually isn't necessarily scientific, although there are barriers for sure. 
The biggest barrier right now is the practical barrier of people just don't want to add things. They just don't want to add anything to their system. And so what can we do to build this capability, build trust into these materials in the first place? That's why we're taking that approach. Yes, ma'am. Well, we can, we can pro along the lines of this question down here, we can program the, 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 the way in which we in, uh, incorporate those materials and the way we attach them to the material that's kind of bearing all the strength. The nanocrystals really don't take much of the load. They're simply re little reporters. But, I mean, will they change their story? So we could, we, could, we could cause them to change their story if there was a large set, sort of overload, which happens. Uh, if we wanted to... If we wanted to see that, we could design it that way. Or we could just design it to know, don't report anything until there's a problem. Exactly. So we can do that. And that's by, that, by the way, is where our research is headed, uh -huh. is in understanding what are those design parameters that govern the way these nanocrystals will respond. Well, yeah, and I'm working with chemists who actually know what they're talking about. <laughs> yes? Yeah, I actually think it's a really good question. I think that within five years, we will have nanocrystals doing something useful in the, some of the industries that planes, trains, and automobiles conjures up. And I'll give you an example. So right now, when you, when you make airplanes, they cost a lot of money, right, those airplanes. And you only make, a, you know, thou, a thousand of them, let's say, a year across all the industries. But what happens if I start putting this advanced material, this composite material, like the 3D printing, into cars? Now I start making millions, tens of millions of things every year. Now when we do that, right, we're very sensitive to the time it takes to make the car, okay? So cycle time, it's called. So the resin, the, the resins that, that cure, that harden, and then provide us the properties that we like, we want to try to keep that time as short as possible. And so what we've demonstrated is that if we put the nanocrystals into the resin, it will tell us when it's done, when the cure, the degree of cure has been reached. And so what we can start to do is we can start to squeeze the process, the time, out of the time it takes to build things like automobiles. And so if I can save a few seconds across millions of cars, I have saved somebody a billion dollars in production costs. So I think kind of like the NASA story. Right? It may not be in your, right, the body or frame of your car, let's say, in a few years, but it may be doing things in the background that you're not even aware of that are very beneficial. And, and so I think that could be a good example of something it could do in the short term, which could be very exciting um, from, a, from a standpoint of, you know, manufacturing technology. And there are other things. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Man, that's such a good question. I don't know. I mean, you know, the thing is, that's, that's exactly what I said at the beginning. I want to be a part of something that's an event, right, that, that people say I was there when it happened. Um, I, think, I, think that, I think that I see in a middle school person's eyes, like my 13-year-old daughter, when she's printing something on a 3D printer, I see in her eye, eye something that's very exciting. And so maybe, maybe what we're doing with technologies like that is we're just creating excitement in individuals, and maybe that's, maybe that's enough to inspire a generation, right? Whereas we inspired a nation with NASA. But you know what? We don't have to inspire a nation. We just have to inspire a 13-year-old girl to get excited about, about uh, this is what I'm trying to do, right? I'm a, I'm a dad. I wanted to go into engineering. But, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but I, think, I think we don't have to inspire a nation. You know, we just have to inspire one person at a time. And, and I, think, I think maybe this technology has the capacity to do that. I'm excited about it. Aren't you? Anything else? Yes? That is such a great question, because I said that at the beginning. Did you catch that when I said picture automotive manufacturing, and then I showed it, and I said it wasn't very sustainable? Well, you know, that material that I showed you winding onto that aircraft, do you know that we can, we can recycle the vast majority of that material? 
we, could, we can get up to, we think, about 95% of that carbon fiber, the, str the strength of that, that fuselage, that, that airplane. We can recycle 95% of that material. And then what job fills? So, well, the landfills would, would need another job, right, if, if, we started to, if we started to think that way. So I think that is one of the exciting things about materials engineering is that it does, if we build the material the way we want and for, for sustainability and, and like some of these composite materials are being built, I think it is, it is very exciting in terms of what we can do around life cycle analysis, reducing the life cycle impact. In fact, the energy we invest to make those materials is much lower too. So, you know, factories, you have to power them. So the, the energy that you have to spend to build those materials is much lower than it is uh, conventional materials too. So there's opportunities. I feel like I have to let you go even though I don't want to. <laughs> any, any, more, any more questions? If there aren't, I mean, please come down and use our broken system. Excuse me, please come down. <laughs> please come down and use our, use, our, use, our, use our smart system. And I really thoroughly enjoyed this. Congratulations to, to all of your, your sons and daughters and, and grandchildren. I'm very uh, happy for everyone. And I'll see you tomorrow Thank at you. commencement. Thank You're welcome. You.